This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 223, recorded on August 6th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello, everybody. Always good to hear you every other week to make sure you're safe and sound. I am safe and sound. I don't know. <laughs> sound of mind is questionable, but otherwise, yes. <laughs> Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Great to hear your voices. And from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Michael uh, had a, a, a hurricane pass just by him and do, do very little damage, and it's knocked out my power until August 10th. Can you believe it? What? That's four days from this recording. Unfortunately, so I came to my Columbia office today to record oh. um, because I don't have power at home. Do you have a generator? No. Yeah, we do for the freezer and fridge, you know, mm -hmm. but um, we can't put everything on it. So that's, yeah, it's better than nothing. Wow. Um, but, I mean, who uh, knew kind of New Jersey crazy. was vulnerable? It's crazy. It's so crazy. Yeah. But here we are in the, the 20th century, 2020, we have a pandemic, we have blackouts, storms. We're just at the mercy of the environment, I guess. Well, and, and our leaders in Washington, D.C., <laughs> until <too>. November. <laughs> yeah. Well, we need your help with that, uh, Michelle. I'm over working in, on it. Over in Michigan, <laughs> good, yeah. Good. Your help. Because where I am and where Alio is is no problem, right? Uh, right. I don't know where where, well, where Michael is. Oh, is a I'm in a very very deep <laughs> red state. <laughs> deep red. Well, deep our red. governor, our governor, Big Gretch, Gretchen Whitmer, yeah. is um, doing a great job. Yep. Okay, let's get on to some science. We're going to start with uh, a little really brief note from Michael. All right, this this is a paper that appeared in JAMA Ophthalmology, and the reason I'm bringing it to our attention today is it be, is because it helps us think about what these COVID-19 tests are actually doing. So the title of the paper is Detection of Coronavirus Disease 2019 Viral Material on Environmental Surfaces of an Ophthalmology Examination Room. Room. And it's brought to us by three Turkish investigators who are at the Izmir Tepcek Training and Research Hospital in Izmir, Turkey, which is located on the coast of the Aegean Sea. And the paper is asking a question that many of us are asking ourselves is, when will it be safe to go back to our normal everyday lives and do normal everyday things like going to the eye doctor? As longtime listeners of TWIM will appreciate, I'm concerned about microbes in the built environment and what risk they present to patients and healthcare providers. And viruses, for better or worse, are still microbes. And the SARS-CoV-2 virus we know is prevalent across the planet. And so what these investigators did is they asked a very straightforward question of whether or not they could detect the presence of the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 on environmental surfaces. And they used a standard six-meter ophthalmic examination room, and they measured before patients went into the room and after patients left for the day. The patients were all asymptomatic by the standard COVID triage, and they actually had uh, measured their temperature, and they were all temperature negative. So again, these are not patients that normally would represent a risk. So 
in their paper, 31 patients or 31 people entered the room that they were sampling. 22 of them sat in the chair where the, you know, the ophthalmic uh, physician asked you the question, better or worse, as you're looking through uh, the device to see whether or not you're 2020 or you need correction. And some of the patients brought along companions. The patients on average were in the room about nine minutes. So that's not very long. And the, the range was between five and 13. And this is, again, a very straightforward before and after study to assess whether or not this room harbored the SARS-CoV-2 virus, or if you will, whether or not you're going to be at risk if you happen to interact with the surfaces. So what they did is before the day started, they tested 14 locations in the room working out from the center of where you as the patient sits, and they worked their way out in a circle, and they had 14 sample points that they checked, and all of the before patients enter the room samples were negative for viral RNA. This is great news. It informs the team that the cleaning of the room the night before with hydrogen peroxide worked. It They detected no signal from any of the 14 samples that they tested. And remember, hydrogen peroxide is a strong oxidant and it will destroy any of the RNA signal that their PCR assay could have picked up. The seven after the patients had been seen for the day, the 22 patients plus the nine companions were taken after the last one left, five of the seven samples were negative. However, two samples collected from zone one, and this is effectively zone one is where the patient is sitting, and the samples were taken from the slit lamp That's the device that the eye doctor uses to examine your cornea and the phoropter, which is that weird piece of kit where you're continuously asked the question better or worse as you're looking through things. And they're effectively looking, sampling on the headrest areas. And two of those samples were indeed positive. And the bottom line in this study is it showed the presence of SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA in, a, in this one meter diameter around where the patients sat. However, as we all appreciate, and this is the important bit of the paper, real-time PCR only detects viral RNA material, not the infectivity of these samples. And I'd like to commend these authors for their careful attention to detail. For example, they decontaminated each room using the hydrogen peroxide before the day began, and they were able to then rule out contamination from the preceding days. However, they report that while the chin rest and forehead rest were wiped down with 70% isopropyl alcohol between patients, they were still able to recover RNA. So here's the point I want to raise. We know that isopropyl alcohol is effective at inactivating this envelope virus. But we also know that isopropyl alcohol is a common reagent we also often use to clean up nucleic acid before we run it on a gel, do any cloning. It doesn't destroy the nucleic acid, which happens to be the substrate of the assay. So should you be concerned with your trip to the eye doctor? The study doesn't especially address this, but what I saw that called my attention to this paper is that the news media picked up on this and a number of the reporters were saying, I won't go to an eye doctor now because their site is contaminated. They they have no answer one way or the other. They're only saying, that the touch point had some viral RNA on it, not whether or not it was infectious. And that's the danger. With And the authors went to great lengths to 
right about the caveats, pointing out that this is only nucleic acid and all of the other things. The other thing that they didn't point out in their paper is they made no mention if the patients were wearing masks during the exam. But as this study was done in early March, before our planet saw the value that simple face coverings would have at reducing viral shedding onto surfaces in our built environments, well, we have no way of knowing if that could effectively make the built environment even safer. The other thing to remember is each patient examined by the ophthalmologist was for all intents and purposes to consider to be well at the time of their exam. They had no fever. They answered no to all the standard triage questions, which is another reason that we all should have listened to TWIV number 640, Mike Minna's arguments that we need to better understand the value of frequent testing of individuals, and then most importantly, what those test results mean. Did the chin rest of the slit lamp harbor infectious virus? It's unlikely because they wiped it down with isopropyl alcohol, and these investigators were very careful. This paper drives home the need for a quick and inexpensive point of care test so that we know if patients and their health care providers are at risk just going about their normal everyday lives. So that's the end of that JAMA ophthalmology paper. It's something for us all to think about as we get queried by reporters about, would you go to an eye doctor? And the answer for me is yes. Yeah, I already went. <laughs> I went and, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> you, yeah. would wear a, you would wear a mask as you were sitting in yes. the Absolutely. I wore a mask and the examiner wore a mask. The doctor wore a mask. Yeah. It right. was, uh, and they, uh, I was fine. And I don't think having RNA on the surface is going to be an issue at all. So I no. wouldn't worry about it. But, but you know, if we had a test where everyone who could test before they left home and said, oh, I'm positive, stay home, that would really be great. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. we'll get to that at some point. But, you know, good for them for, for screening to see um, yeah. Yeah. if... And it is, there weren't a large number of people that came through the room, and yet somebody clearly had yeah. some With shedding. exposure. Yeah, yeah. so um, wear those masks. Wear them, you bet. Wash those hands. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. All right. Uh, Elio, you have a snippet for us. <laughs> okay, I have a paper that's very different. It has nothing to do with going to the eye doctor or anybody like that. The title will tell you. It's called Developmentally Regulated Volatile G. Osmin and 2-Methyl Isoborneol Attract a Soil Arthropod to Streptomyces Bacteria Promoting Spore Dispersal. Boy, this needs a lot of explaining. So I will. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole bunch of authors. Uh, let me just tell the first and the last because otherwise I take too much time. It's Bech, Paul Becker and Klaus Flaird, and they are from all over the place. This is a group about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen authors. They come from Sweden, from England, different places in England from Hungary, uh, from uh, again from uh, a different place in Sweden, and from Australia. It couldn't be more varied. Now, this is a absolutely nice paper. It's just a lovely paper. And the I'll, I'll tell you that I have a lot of help because this paper was discussed in uh, Nature Microbiology by Marco Rolfs. And I believe it's going to be in the show notes. It says, Streptomyces scent attracts spore dispersers. The other thing that I was helped by is by my buddy in Small Things Considered, Roberto Coulter, who wrote a piece called Let Smell Guide You. <laughs> uh, cool. It is a beautiful paper. I mean, it's just, we, we do nice work on Small Things Considered, but this was a gem. So with, with that kind of, so it attracted a lot of attention. And the fact is that the title, although convoluted, is actually a simple message. It's the following. Bacteria are spread by other living things. The spreading of 
bacteria, as of all living things, if you believe this paper by what, what Marco Rolf says, is the dispersal of any species is important for two reasons. One, if you just stay put and don't disperse, you're going to interbreed. That's not very good. And the other is that if you disperse, you're going to go to new sites and occupy new sites. So dispersal is, is a good thing. So how do you disperse? Well, they disperse in two major ways. One is by uh, just simply hanging on to somebody. And the other is to hang on to somebody in a way that you hitchhike to a different place. So this paper is about hitchhiking by <laughs> streptomyces on the back of uh, little, not insects, but in arthropods inhabiting the topsoil called springtails, columbula. I imagine many of the listeners will, have, will know what I'm talking about when I say springtails. They used to be insects. They're not called insects anymore. They're something else. Anyhow, they are attracted to volatile compounds made by streptomyces. The volatile compounds are the thing that makes the smell of soil the smell of soil. If you know what I'm talking about, when you smell soil, you're smelling G. osmin and another compound, which is also, a, they're both terpenoids, 2-methyl isoborneol. I'm going to call it 2-MIB, 2-MIB. Both are extremely noticeable. We don't have the nose that dogs do, but when it comes to geosmin and 2-MIB, we can smell extraordinarily small amounts. So we're very keen, for some reason, to the smell. It's more or less pleasant when it's in the soil. It's not so pleasant when it's in water, for instance, or in food. Anyhow, the um, uh, springtails can smell this beautifully. So how do they know that? Well, they made, they put tra they made traps, which they put in uh, different places in a foreign site, two foreign sites in Sweden. And the traps consisted of a tiny mini petri dish containing the streptomyces that make these volatile compounds, surrounded by some gooey stuff, this a gooey surface, so that the springtails would get stuck. So they waited a day and they went back and sure enough there were lots of springtails on the traps. So and they found that the, and there were not others. In fact, it turns out that things like Drosophila are repelled by G. Osman. Hmm. Why is not quite clear. We can go into that. But anyhow, the springtails are all over the place. So now they use this as a research model. You can grow uh, springtails in, in your backyard, in your lab. And they made a very, very clever essay. After growing the streptomyces, and this is streptomyces cellicolor, this is one of the common, common garden variety streptomyces that's used in research, uh, they grew it and they enriched for the volatile compounds. They split the result of chromatography, of gas chromatography, into two places. One, they send it to the detector, and the other one is they send the same sample to immobilized springtails. They immobilize springtails in such a way that they stuck them into little glass capillary with their heads and antenna sticking out. Okay? So they found that when the... Um, and they measured, by electrophysiology, they measured the response of the antennae. Don't ask me about that, because I don't know. <laughs> okay? And so they had a sample going into the detector of the gas chromatogram and the other one going in immobilized springtails. And sure enough, whenever the peak for the geosmin and the, um, what, what did I call it? BLMD or MIB or something like that. Let me call it 2 MIB. Anyhow, two -mib. whenever those peaks came up, the, the antenna responded. So this is a clever, interesting assay. So that's nice. So the springtails can smell these molecules. Okay? Now, so what's the significance of this? Well, it turns out 
that the genes in the streptomyces that make G. Osmonds and 2-MIB are regulated by spore-making genes. Mm. In other words, when the uh, streptomyces make spores, they emit these compounds. Nice. It's effectively calling the Uber. It's effectively what it's... It's good. it's effectively when the genes turn on, it's like you requesting the Uber to come pick you up to Love deliver it. you to the new location. I mean, and, it's incredible. And you call them as you're putting on your coat. That's right. right? <laughs> that's <laughs> right. And that's what coat. the stink is all about. Yeah. Better yet. Better yet. <laughs> oh, I like that. So <laughs> the Uber mechanism that's... Uh, Sertomyces used to call up their their transport mechanism, namely the springtails. So this sounds very uh, interesting. It's very intricate, but it's very interesting because this is a, a way for the spores of Sertomyces to be dispersed. And so they went and looked, Is does, does this actually happen? So using their peach with the chassis, they could put the, the springtails on the surface and the streptomyces in the middle. And sure enough, uh, in the presence of springtails, streptomyces colonies appeared farther away from the origin, from the where they were. Cool. Right. Hmm. So they move, they really move around. So um, when times get tough and cells begin to sporulate, the bacteria begin to sporulate, they attract animals, at least they attract springtails. And by attaching, they disperse to great distances, and frankly, this is a beautiful paper. And in fact, Ilya, when in Roberto's Small Things Considered piece, he this is one of the quotes out of Roberto's discussion. Relating my thoughts to my friend, uh, Gilles Van Weasel, he told me something like this. Of course, you know, camels. Camels can smell geosm 80 kilometers away. Wow. That's how they find water-filled oases in the desert. Once they re reach the water and drink it, they are coated with these streptomyces spores and they disseminate them. So there's more, there's just not, not just springtail, the camels too can act as Ubers. Yeah. The, the, you're just calling the Uber and say, I got to move. It's like calling an Uber to go to the airport. That's Which right. we'll never be able to do again unless we get a vaccine. There, there, That's uh, amazing. There are virus stories like this. So oh, for yeah, example, absolutely. There are viruses that infect plants that cause the plants to give off volatile substances. Oh, yes. And those volatiles attract aphids to the plant, and then the aphids feed on the sap. But then the other volatiles made by uh, virus infection make it taste very bad and immediately – the aphid flies off to another plant and it spreads the virus. <laughs> yeah. That's so not brilliant. only do the volatiles attract, you know, the vector, but they send it off again. So this wow. is very common in the virus world. It's amazing. Absolutely That's amazing. Cool. And it's it's reminding me that um, transmission is really critical to any pathogen. And if you're a microbe, you can't leave it to chance. And so you've shown you've all have just talked about these volatiles that do it. And it's reminding me of the mycobacterium tuberculosis story that we did yeah. Coughing, a couple episodes right? ago where they induce their host yep. to cough. Mm -hmm. Which Absolutely. is their mode of transmission. I would so. say transmission is the major selective force. For, for microbial evolution. It's nothing and they else. talk about this being a selective pressure. So right. that's another thing that as you're thinking about talking to your students and reporters about how COVID-19 is changing, you have to fundamentally ask, what is the selective pressure that will drive that virus to change? Oh, people don't think about that, Michael. <laughs> you know, they don't. They just think, oh, this is this has happened without thinking of the no. pressure. But I, and, I do think yeah. that identify, identifying what the selective force is is very important because otherwise you can't explain something. And so we we just on our recent twins, we we've covered tuberculosis and the cough. And now we have literally a smell facilitating movement of microbes. If they go 80 kilometers with a camel. That's really quite <laughs> remarkable. It's very cool. 
Very cool. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. Very nice stuff. So I've got a paper called Subpopulations of Stressed Yersinia Pseudotuberculosis Preferentially Survive Doxycycline Treatment Within Host Tissues. And this was published um, this month in MBio. It's open access, so uh, readers can follow along at home if they like. And it was work by Jasmine ramirez Renesis, Alicia Ellison, Bessie Liu and Kim Davis, and they work at Johns Hopkins. And this study was motivated by a urgent public health problem, which is antibiotic-resistant infections. So according to the CDC, every year here in the U.S., 2.8 million people are infected by microbes that are resistant to one or more antibiotics, and 35,000 people die each year from infections that can't be treated. So classically, we think of antibiotic resistance as something that microbes acquire by selective pressure, by a mutation, or acquisition by horizontal transfer of a plasmid that can encode some resistance mechanism. So this is why we practice um, antibiotic stewardship. Antibiotics are a precious resource. We've got to use them judiciously and minimize the selective pressure so that we don't select for emergence of resistant variants. But there are other ways that microbes can actually tolerate or avoid being cleared by antibiotic treatment. And that's what this paper investigates. So they, um, for their study, they take advantage of a really nice animal model of infection, which is Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. So to set the stage, this is a bug that can go from the bloodstream, get into the bloodstream, and then when the blood is filtered in the spleen, and there are lots of white blood cells there, Yersinia can actually set up shop and begin to form um, colonies growing in the spleen. So this doesn't go unnoticed. Um, neutrophils come uh, screaming in and try to eat and kill the bacteria, but Yersinia is equipped with a type 3 secretion system. It can um, block its own uptake by these um, neutrophils. So then monocytes are recruited in, um, and they spray the um, bacteria with um, nitric oxide, which is a really reactive and toxic um, substance that's key for our innate immune system. But this microbe, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, also has mechanisms to tolerate nitric oxide. And so the bacteria uh, form these microcolonies in the spleen. So that now if a person reports to their healthcare worker, they have an infection, you treat with antibiotics, can we clear all of those uh, Yersinia in the spleen with antibiotic treatment? So that's the question that they're going to get at using a um, mouse model of infection. And so they know from um, previous work by uh, Kim Davis when she was a postdoc with Ralph Isberg and other colleagues that Yersinia, when it starts to form these uh, colonies, it is able to detoxify the nitric oxide using a particular protein that we'll talk about later. But what's not clear is whether the bacteria are able to continue to, to survive and grow in these microcolonies because they are, the antibiotic just can't reach them, it just can't diffuse in, or have the bacteria um, erected some other shield uh, to protect themselves. So to get at these interesting questions, Jasmine and her colleagues developed these really clever reporters that um, they are able to use to gauge whether or not the bacteria within the microcolony are even exposed to the antibiotic. And in this case, we're using um, doxycycline, which is used clinically to treat these infections. So the, the strategy that they use to ask whether or not the bacteria within the microcolonies are exposed to the antibiotic takes advantage of a really nifty mechanism that is common in bacteria. Um, it's a mechanism that bacteria use to protect themselves from this class of drugs. So it's a, the tetracycline um, operon. And in particular, they make a protein TET A, which can pump this tetracycline out of the cell. But the bacteria only make this pump if there's tetracycline around. And the way this switch works is normally there is a repressor sitting on the um, promoter, 
of this pump. And if there's no antibiotic around, the gene's not expressed. But if antibiotic diffuses into the bacterial cell, it binds to the TET repressor and dislodges it from the DNA. And now the bacteria can make the uh, machinery that can pump the drug out. So this is a, a a clever um, switch that is sensitive, very sensitive to the amount of tetracycline. So what these um, investigators did was just swap out that pump and instead they inserted the gene that encodes the fluorescent reporter called M-Cherry. So by doing this, they've generated a strain of your pseudotuberculosis, which is will only turn on M. cherry and become bright red if it's exposed and senses um, tetracycline, or in this case, the derivative doxycycline. They also um, use a strain that not only expresses this um, M. cherry reporter of doxycycline, but also they make it constitutively express green fluorescent protein. So they can look in the microscope and see all of the bacteria in these microcolonies in the spleen. So after they do a series of control experiments that verifies that their M-cherry reporter is in fact induced by the antibiotic and they can estimate what concentration is sufficient to turn it on, they're ready now to go into their mouse model of infection. So they have this Yersinia, infectious Yersinia pseudotuberculosis strain, constitutively expresses GFP, and then carries this reporter of doxycycline exposure. They infect mice with it by into their veins. And then 40 hours later, they inject the mice, their peritoneal cavity, with a heavy dose of doxycycline. They wait 24 hours and then go in and harvest the spleen and look at it. They also quantify how many viable Yersinia remain uh, with or without the doxycycline treatment. And then they can use the microscope to see whether or not the cells are um, had been exposed to doxycycline by looking at their red fluorescence. So in the first figure, we see that they um, did in fact get a about a 50-fold drop in the number of viable Yersinia in the spleen after they did their um, treatment with doxycycline. However, there were still, uh, the numbers went from 5 times 10 to the 6th viable cells down to 10 to the 5th viable cells. So clearly, some were killed, but there was still a reservoir of viable cells. They also looked in the microscope, and they could see that, in fact, um, the microcolonies or clusters of bacteria in the in the spleen were smaller if the mouse had been treated with doxycycline. And they also saw that there was um, M. cherry fluorescence um, in the microcolony, meaning the bacteria had been exposed. And in fact, they saw that in the center of the uh, microcolony, they were more fluorescent than the cells out at the periphery. So this first experiment um, did show that the Yersinia pseudotuberculosis um, is able to survive by some mechanism, but we don't know quite what, quite, um, what, the, what the mechanism is because they realized that formally, perhaps the M. cherry that they were seeing was synthesized by the Yersinia shortly after infection. And because this M. cherry is so stable, it might just be an accumulated marker of previous exposure. So they carefully repeated their experiment, but now making two technical uh, modifications to increase their um, sensitivity and specificity. And that is they took advantage of an antibiotic derivative of doxycycline that um, can still release that TET repressor and turn on the promoter, but it's modified in such a way that it doesn't have um, high affinity for the bacterial target, which for this antibiotic is the ribosome. So we can still use doxycycline to turn on the M. cherry reporter of exposure, but it won't uh, stall translation protein expression by the bacteria. They also wanted to increase their sensitivity with this M. cherry. So they added to the M. cherry protein a tail that directs the M. cherry protein to a digestive um, uh, system, the proteasome within the bacteria. And by adding this SSRA tag to M. cherry, they were able to reduce the half-life of their reporter from weeks down to just 35 minutes. 
So they could now more carefully deduce when the bacteria would have been exposed um, to doxycycline and turned on their reporter. It's actually pretty sophisticated. Take an antibiotic and make it lousy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but still sufficient to turn on the promoter. Right. So right. really, really clever use of, of genetics and, and the literature. It's, it's one thing that, that I thought was so beautiful about this paper. So they then did another series of control experiments. They wanted to um, verify that this destabilized M. cherry was behaving as they expected. And they also were able to um, learn that what, what concentration of doxycycline would turn on M. cherry expression. So for example, at 0.01 microgram per mil, it didn't turn on. And at one microgram per mil, also um, no expression. But at 0.1 microgram per mil, that was the sweet spot where they got um, M. cherry expression. So this will allow them to kind of approximate what exposures um, the bacteria are experiencing. So they then repeated this IV infection um, using these two different uh, type, two different variants of doxycycline, the active and the inactive form, and then also the the um, M. cherry that wouldn't hang around for forever, so they could more easily deduce when when exposure occurred. So after 48 hours of infection, they again treated with either the doxycycline or the non-toxic variant, and then harvested spleens at either um, two hours, four hours, or 24 hours later. And this time, they saw that when they used the non-toxic derivative of doxycycline, the bacteria at the periphery of the microcolony were brighter than those at the center of the microcolony. And they also saw that when they used the doxycycline, so this is the toxic version, now M. cherry um, was highest in the center of the microcolony, higher than at the periphery. So by giving some thought here and comparing this to what they saw from their reporters in vitro, they were able to conclude that, in fact, doxycycline is getting into the microcolonies, but yet the majority of the bacteria are still viable. So we can't invoke the reason that the bacteria aren't cleared is because the drug is not, not getting to where the bacteria are. Their reporter said, yes, in fact, concentrations do reach the center of these clusters in the spleen. So what could be the mechanism? So again, here they um, are smart scientists. They um, are familiar with the literature and they know of some examples um, from some recent papers, you know, the last couple years, that for a number of pathogens, when they're exposed to stress, they can induce a tolerance to antibiotics that's a physiological um, resistance, not a genetic mutation. So, for example, um, earlier this year, Rao and colleagues published in Nature Microbiology that reactive oxygen species released by our innate immune uh, response, monocytes and um, neutrophils, can induce Staph aureus to tolerate a variety of antibiotics. And again, this isn't a genetic change, but rather a cellular differentiation change. And then others have reported for Salmonella, Burkholderia, um, and other microbes that nitric oxide can also trigger this physiological tolerance of antibiotics. So this group was interested in whether or not the Yersinia pseudotuberculosis in these microcolonies in the spleen were also inducing this physiological tolerance to antibiotics. So to ask that question, again, they made another very clever fluorescence reporter. They took advantage of um, knowing that Yersinia, when they're exposed to nitric oxide, they turn on a detoxifying protein, which is called, it's a flavohemoprotein that is um, abbreviated HMP. So they fused the HMP promoter to M. cherry, and this then would allow them to look in their spleens and learn what cells in the spleen, what bacterial cells in the spleen are stressed by nitric oxide and turning on M. cherry. So they repeated these IV infections of the mouse using the bacteria that had HMP expressing M. cherry and also GFP as a denominator. So we can see all the bacteria in the population. 
And again, they waited 48 hours and then treated either with the doxycycline or the non-toxic derivative of doxycycline, and then harvested the spleen at two hours or four hours and took a look. And here, using flow cytometry, they found that the majority of the bacteria that expressed HMP increased, the percent of cells that expressed the HMP detoxifier increased after um, doxycycline treatment but not after treatment with the non-toxic uh, variant of the antibiotic. So they've become viable but non-culturable cells in their assay. And if our listeners will recall, we have been talking about this sorts of these sorts of physiological situations as the cell can be referred to as a persister cell. It can be rec- referred to as a VBNC cell, or it can be as they are referring to the cells. Right. Although they do point out that they'll have to do a lot more work in vitro with pure cultures to to really understand uh, which of those mechanisms is at Mm -hmm. play. But for certain, in the um, context of an in vivo infection, they saw that expression of HMP um, was increased after exposure to antibiotic. So after doing more control experiments and looking at um, their data sets, they were able to conclude that when Yersinia gets into the spleen and forms these microcolonies, macrophages are recruited, monocytes are recruited, they release nitric oxide, and this induces expression of the HMP detoxifier by the Yersinia tuberculosis that are at the periphery of the microcolony. And therefore, um, they are not cleared by the neutrophils, but also they are um, tolerant now when the investigators treat the mouse with um, doxycycline. So it, in particular, using their HMP M. cherry reporter, they were able to see that those cells that express HMP are the ones that become uh, predominant in the population after exposure to, to the doxycycline. So this is how they were able to deduce that within these microcolonies in the spleen, the bacteria can turn on this tolerance pathway and persist during doxycycline. Now by repeating these experiments and looking at longer exposures of our longer incubation periods after infection with the bacteria. And by looking at their uh, reporters, they could see that after about 48 hours by 72 hours, the amount of doxycycline in the spleen starts to wane. You know, the the antibiotic has a half-life. So they saw that as the doxycycline concentrations decline, they now begin to see regrowth um, of the Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. So they begin to increase in numbers, and um, eventually the mouse uh, will succumb to the infection. So it's um, it's counterintuitive, but what we find is that it's the bacteria that are at the periphery of these microcolonies that are first doused with nitric oxide, become tolerant, and even though they're being exposed to doxycycline in the spleen, they can withstand it. And then as the doxycycline concentrations wane, those tolerant bacteria can then begin to regrow and seed uh, more spots in the spleen, and eventually um, the mouse dies. So this is actually concerning because we know similar patterns have been um, observed, as I mentioned, for Staph aureus, for Salmonella. And it turns out that molecules that we rely on, our innate immune system relies on, like nitric oxide and reactive oxygen species, are actually triggering a number of pathogens to induce a state that tolerates antibiotics. So even though the, the bacteria are genetically susceptible to antibiotics, this simple um, exposure to our innate immune system and these inflammatory uh, molecules or molecules pr- produced during inflammation uh, make them phenotypically tolerant of antibiotics. So this is yet another challenge that we are going to face 
um, and that we as experimentalists need to uh, better understand and dissect so that we can figure out how to short circuit this interesting mechanism of tolerating antibiotics so that we can continue to use our antibiotics to treat a wide range of um, systemic infections. So what you've just reinforced, Michelle, is that you need to understand the selective pressure that the microbe is reacting to. And you so elegantly, and this group has so elegantly shown that it's the innate immune system that's one of the principal selective forces that the microbe is using to adapt its behavior to. And so as you're thinking about designing your experiments, ask yourself the fundamental question, what is the selective, what are the selective pressures acting on the microbe that you're trying to uh, effectively uh, address? One, one of the interesting things about our first author, ja- Jasmine Ramirez, is she came to the field of microbiology because uh, uh, she was concerned about health issues. And she did an undergraduate degree in micro at Loyola University, where she took her first course in micro. It was here that she learned this is where she belonged and her love of the field solidified soon thereafter and when she was asked to be able to help in assisting identifying unknown microbes from the biology department. She then went on to do a master's degree at St. Joseph's University and worked on bacteriology and immunology topics at both the University of Pennsylvania and Johns Hopkins. And so it's that collective mashup of immunology and microbe that helps you develop that thought process of thinking about these selective pressures. And and she, in, in a response to a query, she wrote, a particularly exciting day in the lab for this research project was the first day she saw Yersinia pseudotuberculosis form that microcolony. And after doing those first few in vivo experiments with these remarkable reporter strains, the M. cherry, the GFP, where she sectioned and processed the tissues and and sat down and had that, oh, wow, moment at the microscope (laughs) with the hope that she would actually be able to see the microbes talk to her by literally waving that fluorescent signal at her after the weeks of work that went into creating the constructs, doing the animal experiments. So, you know, she, she had a lot of anticipation before she sat down and it was so exciting for her to see that first micro colony. And then until you actually have that, gab smacking smack you upside the head moment yourself when you see it you you don't really appreciate that oh wow experience and it's a special time because usually when people are doing fluorescence microscopy they're in a small black room all by themselves and so to see those colors pop and know that the bacteria are telling you their secrets is really, uh, really exciting. And I want to give these people credit. They've done really beautiful um, kind of this single cell analysis by microscopy and also flow um, cytometry. But they've also done really careful quantitative data that is throughout the paper. A lot of um, a lot of quantitative assays of colony form- forming units, the size of the micro colonies, the expression in the center of the microcolony versus the periphery of the microcolony. It's, it's really carefully done, but, but makes a, a good point that we cannot only study antibiotic resistance in log phase uh, or stationary phase mm-hmm. cells. We've got to do it in the context of, as Michael said, the selective pressure of the innate immune system and these um, special locations, whether it's in the a granuloma of the MTB lung or um, these uh, abscesses by staph or, in this case, these microcolonies in the spleen mm-hmm. uh, formed by Yersinia. I'm trying to think, where's the good news? Yeah, right. Very good news. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Good news yeah. is that we're figuring this out. Yeah, That's exactly. the good news. The system, we right. 
percent better, but it's right now it's nothing but bad news. <laughs> well, it's you know true. that's the that's the advice she leaves us with. She just wants to make two quick points, and this is Jasmine speaking: that working in research can be difficult, especially when your experiments don't always work out the way you had planned. But the end product of your efforts can be something that makes a positive impact on the community, on the environment, on the future, and that it's important to take care of yourself, to prioritize your physical and mental health throughout your career process. And and beyond science, Jasmine enjoys uh, finding new food places, brewing beer like all good microbiologists, yoga, hiking, and paddleboarding. Sometimes she even puts her Corgi the dog on top of the paddleboard with her. (laughs) With a little life preserver. With a little life preserver, (laughs) yes. Yeah. Well, and it's wonderful that Jasmine is sharing her expertise and also her passion for science um, now as as an instructor herself, right? She's at Loyola. I forgot to point that out. Yes. Mm -hmm. She's now... Back at Loyola, Loyola, her undergraduate institution, actually sharing what what she has learned with the undergraduate that she was only a short time ago, back in 2013. So it's not too long ago that she was a, a student sitting in the chair, listening to the faculty member drone on, but now she's there to inspire the next generation. Doing her own droning. Doing her own yeah. droning. All right. Two letters for today. First from Gordon, who writes, hello, Vincent, and the TWIM team. One question about TWIM 218. Wow. it's a long time ago. <laughs> this question relates to Michael's comment that a dry climate might make it somewhat less likely to be exposed to SARS-CoV-2 because the water in exhaled aerosols would quickly evaporate. This seems to imply that virus particles in the aerosols would be inactivated by the loss of water. Is this correct? I've been wondering about the role of evaporation for a while, as it seems to me that after evaporation, a much smaller virus particle would be left behind. This could easily pass through a mask. If the virus were still active, that would be a problem. Michael, is that? did you actually say that? I, I believe I did. Um, you know, it's it's where the common expression in the desert climates when they report it's 120 degrees, but it's a dry heat. And that's simply because you perspire and your sweat just wicks off of your body so quickly that you actually feel cooler. And, yeah, yeah. Even, okay. and the virus will probably actually be smaller but it's again the torsional the droplet, forces. The, the, the droplet containing the virus will be smaller. Yes. Well, yes. but I I have learned, and I don't remember whether it was listening to a podcast or whether it was reading um, about like perhaps work from the Virginia Tech group studying microbes and aerosols. That actually, when we're out in humid air and we expire moisture with microbes in them, those tiny droplets will collide with the moisture droplets in the air yeah, and they'll get right. larger and fall to Drop. the ground more quickly. That is right. correct. So it's actually um, the six feet distance that we're all practicing um, is, is uh, less important. Well, I, I don't want to say that. <laughs> it, you're it's even, you're that's even more important. safe in a, in a moist um, yeah. misty uh, day than a, than a dry day. Yeah. So that's the dry is the opposite. The, the droplets would evaporate. Uh, and go farther. The problem right. is that in a very warm climate, you're tending to be indoors, and that's where most of the transmission occurs. You're probably right. in an, an right, air conditioned right, right. environment. So, and the relative humidity indoors is typically set by the air conditioner company yeah. at about forty percent. Yeah. All right. So, Gordon continues. My comment is in relation to the discussion of fungal contamination. Hey, Elio, fungi, fungi. Hey. <laughs> As an industrial hygienist, I have been involved in many fungal remediation projects. You definitely want to wear a proper NIOSH approved respirator. NIOSH. NIOSH. I know, Michael, but I I like to spell it out for people. Okay. An N95 or P, I I know what NIOSH is, N95 or P100, not a mask. While it is generally true 
that people do not develop fungal infections unless immunocompromised. It's also true that some people become allergic to fungal fragments, mycelia, and fungal spores. This can make a contaminated environment um, unable for them. Probably another word you wanted to use. Proper protective equipment and procedures can prevent this. Cheers, Gordon. All right. Hmm. That's absolutely right. Thank you, Gordon. And then one more from Brendan, your Twimmers. It's a beautiful day here in Chengdu with temperatures up at 31C and some nice high scattered clouds. I'm writing to follow up on the Mars regolith experiment. Uh, the Mars regolith analog methanogen paper discussion. I'm just a space and biology nerd with no formal education in either, and I found it was fascinating and accessible discussion. There were a couple of points you all brought up which drove me to go and read the paper, which revealed some more interesting details I want to recount here. Uh, one regarding Michael's question about whether Mars has plate tectonics. We know Mars had a geologically active past because we can see the huge Olympus Mons and numerous other inactive volcanoes on Mars's surface. However, we also have evidence that much of Mars' recent existence has been geologically inactive. There's no evidence for a strong magnetic field like Earth. So the current view is that Mars does not have plate tectonics now and maybe never did. The hypothesized source of water and motive for this paper is actually not deep subsurface, but instead near subsurface, specifically a feature they mentioned called RSL or recurring, sl recurring slope lineae. These features, which are seasonally appearing dark patterns on steep hillsides, were first observed in the last decade from a probe in Mars orbit and re-sparked the we've found water on Mars debate. <laughs> Arguments yes. continue about whether the RSL are because of water or sand grain landslides, but spectroscopic analysis does support water in RSLs as the result of deliquescence of perchlorate and chlorate salts. Hmm. That's good news for Elon Musk. <laughs> Number two, Michael mentioned that the authors ran a control using perchlorates to inactivate the methanogens. This really caught my attention because we know from the Mars Phoenix lander and reanalysis of the Viking lander data that Mars soil contains perchlorates in the range of 0.1 to 5 to 1%. As far as I can tell from reading the paper, the perchlorate used by the authors, sodium perchlorate, was added in 30 weight percent as one of two ways in order to facilitate the deliquescence conditions. The other salt used was sodium chloride, also at 30% weight in a different experiment, which yielded methane production. In the materials and methods section, the authors mentioned that the negative control was no salts, neither table salt nor sodium perchlorate or water, and thus no deliquescence. Since we now know perchlorates can inactivate microorganisms, it's not surprising that the sample with sodium perchlorate at 30% would not see methane production. But putting my reviewer number one hat on, I would like to see another <laughs> experiment where they can achieve deliquescence and observe methane production or not with a Mars regolith analog that also has 0.5 to 1% perchlorate. Here, here. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. It would be reviewer number three, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And finally, number three, finally, regarding Alios' pessimism about life originating on other planets, I would say that we probably don't have enough evidence one way or the other to conclude on the chances of independent origins of life. I recently read The Origins of Life by John Maynard Smith and Eeyore Seth Mary, which summarized scenarios for the conditions on how self-replicating molecules could form cellular life. The speculation that they recount makes it seem there are many possible environments and geometries of environments where which life could have started in, and we have no concrete experimental evidence for what works or not. This is different from the evolution of eukaryotes, where, as I understand, we have some evidence that the symbiosis with mitochondria only happened once. On that point, I'd agree with Alio. That seems like an exceedingly rare kind of event to possibly rule it out happening in life originating independently elsewhere in the universe. I read about this in Nick Lane's book, Oxygen, which along with Origins of Life might be a bit out of date. So I'm skating on thin ice and would appreciate any reading suggestions to get more up to speed on current theories for the origins of life. So in conclusion, I'm more optimistic, unsure of life originating elsewhere. But if it's exceedingly rare to get complex life, which leaves unambiguous biosignatures, then we really may be stuck for a long time not being able to know. Let the debate continue. <laughs> Thanks for such a great podcast. Keep safe. I look forward to the next TWIM. Brendan. Thank you, Brendan. 
Yeah, yeah thanks for that very thoughtful, uh, illuminating email. I have read uh, pretty much all of Nick Lane's book books, and he always readdresses things he's he's touched in earlier books. So, uh, I, if there's not a more recent one than Oxygen, that's it. I think that's pretty. You could look up his papers because he does publish as well, Brendan. All right, that's it for Twim two two three. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twim. That's where you'll find links to the articles and the text of the letters that we read. And if you do have a question, you can send them to twim at microbe.tv. And if you really enjoy what we do, consider supporting us. You can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute for ways that you can contribute to our expenses. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Great to be with you again. Elio Schechter is at the blog Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. Thank you. And Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Enjoyed it. And I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Thank you.